Hello friends, Jermaine here and welcome to this mini course. We're going to be building a real-time photo sharing app running on Superbase as our backend, Wade Platter as our client and Riverpod as our state management solution. Superbase is an open source Firebase alternative which has support for most of the features that come with Firebase such as authentication, cloud functions, real-time subscriptions, etc. And in terms of the database solution, Superbase runs on PostgreSQL. Let's take a look at what we'll be building. Over here we've got two devices running. I'm currently logged in my Android device. Let's go ahead and add a memory by pressing the floating action button at the bottom right. I'll uh, give it a title and I'll select an image at which point we see the file name of the image and then we'll submit. Upon submitting we see that the image is added as an entry which automatically shows up on the iOS simulator via real-time update. I can like this entry which also updates on the simulator and then of course we can make edits by pressing the icon in the middle and then having paragliding for fun let's log in via the simulator and now that we're logged in let's also like this image and then let's add an entry and let's select this image of the puppy then we can like this image and then i'll also like it from the android device i can delete this entry which also updates the simulator. And to log out, we'll press the icon at the top right, which displays the login at the bottom. All right, let's get started. It would be useful to describe how we're modeling our data in our database. We have three tables that we'll be creating. The memories table represents our entries. Each entry would have a title, an image ID, as well as a foreign key constraint pointing to the profile which created this particular memory. And if we look at our profiles, each profile is added automatically whenever a new user is created. And the reason why we need to do that is because our auth.users is not directly accessible from our app. So then our public profile ID points to the ID in our auth users table. And then the username will be extracted from our raw user metadata, which is a JSON serialized string and the auth.users and then each column would have a created at timestamp for all of them. The likes table contains details of each memory that we like and who liked it. There's a foreign key constraint on the memory ID field which points to the ID of the memory that was liked and also has a profile ID here pointing to the user liking the memory. All right so in the new tab we're going to go to database.new which will bring us to this create a new project screen. We'll set a name for our project. And then for now, we'll just generate a password. I'll select the region and then click create. It will take a couple of minutes to set up the project. Once our project is initialized, let's go ahead and create our tables by clicking on table editor, and then we'll click to create a new table. This will be our profiles table. The ID will be of type UUID. And then we'll edit the foreign key relation, which will point to our auth schema, and in particular, the users table. And the column will be the users ID. And then under the action, we will cascade so that whenever we delete a record from our users table, or we'll also remove this record in our profile. Let's go ahead and save. Our created at column will be a timestamp. And then I'll click the settings icon and untick this one. We'll add a new column for our username, which will be of type text. And then I'll untick this one as well, which is because we want these values to be defined. All right, let's save. And there we have our table created with our columns. Let's create our second one. This will be our memories table and we want to enable real time. I'll leave the ID field as such and then just ensure that this is ticked for created at. We don't want it to be nullable. And then we'll add three more columns, which will be for our title, our image ID 
and then the profile ID. Our title will be of type text and it's not nullable. Same as our image ID. Our profile ID will have a foreign key relation pointing to our profiles table and in particular the ID. And then when the row is removed, we want to cascade. Let's save. And before we save, we'll untick that. And then let's save. All right, then lastly, we want to create our likes table. We'll also enable real time. We'll untick this one and we'll add two new columns. These columns will be our memory ID and our profile ID. Memory ID will be an 8 byte integer. Untick this one. And we'll also have a foreign key relation pointing to the ID of memories. And then under action, we'll click on cascade. Let's save that. And then our profile ID will be a universally unique identifier. And then untick this one. Let's save. Okay, so now that we've got our tables, what we need to do is to define the relevant policies for each of our tables so that they're accessible from the client. We'll come under authentication and then we'll click on policies. And then for each of these tables, we see no policies are created yet. Let's add a new policy for our likes table. We'll select from a template and then we'll select enable read access to everyone and then use this template, leave everything as is and then click review. And then over here, we see the SQL statement that will be written to create this policy and then we'll save. And then we'll add a new policy. And for this one, we want to create from scratch and the policy name will be enabling all actions for users based on their profile ID and the operation will be all. Target roles are select authenticated. And then the expression here we want to check that the authenticated user's ID is equal to the value in our profile ID field. So auth.uid is from Superbase, which contains details of the currently authenticated user. And therefore we need to match that against the profile ID that will be sent across. And then let me copy that and paste the same in here. We can review and then save. And we pretty much need to do the same for these two. For profiles, however, our second policy will also be based off a template and we want to enable delete access for users based on their user ID. So we we'll use this template and then the target roles will be authenticated and we want to check it against the ID column. We'll review and then we'll save. Since our auth users table is private and we are using profiles as a means of accessing user data, we essentially need to create a trigger which will populate our profiles table when our user is added. So what we'll do is on the database, we'll click on functions and then we'll create a new function. The name of our function under new user, schema will be public, the return type will be a trigger. And then in the definition here, we want the following logic. What we're doing here is with each new created user, we are extracting the ID and then the username, which is passed in as raw metadata. And we're using that to populate the ID and username columns of our profiles table. And then we need to make sure to return new and end our statement and check show advanced settings. And then the type of security, we want a security definer. And then we'll confirm and then once that's added, we'll come to our triggers and then we'll create a new trigger. The name will be on auth user added. And then the table we're watching is our auth users table. 
The events in particular we care about is the insert operation. The trigger type will fire after the operation is completed. And then our orientation will fire for each processed row. Then we'll scroll down afterwards and we'll choose our function to trigger, which is our handy new user function. And let's confirm. And then we see it here. Lastly, we need to configure our storage bucket for storing the images we upload. We'll come under storage and then we'll create a new bucket. We'll call it memories and then we'll make it public and then create our bucket. We need to configure the policies for this bucket. We'll add a new policy and we'll choose from a template. And then we want to give users access to their own top level folder named as their user ID. We'll go ahead and use this template and the allowed operations are select, insert and delete. We'll click to review and then we'll save. And now our storage bucket is set with the correct policies. So onto the code base. Over here, we've got the setup for our memories Flutter app, which has the relevant packages installed, including Superbase Flutter and Flutter River Pod, among other packages. This setup can be accessed in the starter branch on the GitHub repository. In our main.dart file, we are initializing Superbase and also initializing River Pod by wrapping our my app consumer widget in a provider scope. Before we run this app, Let's retrieve our URL and key from Superbase. In our dashboard, we'll come to our project settings and then under API, we'll copy over the project URL and then we'll copy over our public key. I'll save that and then let's run this by pressing F5. We've got the relevant screens set up already where this is our main home screen. And then when we click this, we come to our login screen, which also has the option to create a new account. Should we create a new account, then we're brought to this verification screen. And then once the account is verified, we're back to this home screen, at which point we'll be logged in. The first journey we're going to look at is the journey of creating a new account. And this is where our onboarding feature comes in. So over here under onboarding, we'll create a new file. We'll call this file onboarding repository, which sits under the API directory. We'll start by creating a class called onboarding repository. This class will have a client field, which holds a reference to Superbase's client object. Let's import Superbase Flutter. And then this will be followed by two methods. The sign up method, which requires the following fields, our email, password, username. And then in here, we're going to return the result of client.auth.signup, which accepts our email and password. And to pass in the username, we need to define the data named argument, which is a map. We'll pass in username as the key and the value will be our username that we pass in. We'll also define a verify code method which accepts the email address and the verification code sent to the user's email. And over here, we'll invoke client.auth.verifyOTP. We'll pass in the email. Then the token will be the verification code. And then the type will be OTP type dot sign up. And to make this available to our widgets, we need to expose this via a provider. So to do that, we'll define this function called onboarding repository which returns an instance of our onboarding repository. And since we're using code generation with Riverpod, I'll add the Riverpod annotation here and be sure to import Riverpod annotation and be sure to add an underscore here. Since we're not going to be using the ref object that we passed in, we need to define this parts file. Once we've got that, let's run the command to generate our code, which is flutter pub run build runner build. We should see this file added over here. And then in order to use this provider, we'll first need to export it. And then we'll come to our auth folder under view, click on login page, which is the screen over here. Now on our login page, we've got the button to create an account, which is this widget being rendered here. At the moment it directs to verification. 
but then instead we want to check that our current form is valid and if so we create an account and if our current form is not valid we turn on auto validation and then our create account method is defined here we'll start with a try catch block in this try catch block start by enabling the submitting flag which will disable the buttons and the form fields while the submission is going on and then seeing that we are in a consumer state we can access our onboarding repository provider and then invoke our sign up method the email address is from our email controller which contains the value for the email address form field i'll do the same with password and then username if the sign up succeeds then we'll check if our current screen is still mounted before we do a context.push redirecting to our verification screen. If this fails, then we display the error to the user by showing a snack bar message. And then lastly, we want to reset the submit state to false. Before we pass in our username, we also need to ensure that the information that we've entered, such as our email, password, and username is also passed onto to the verification screen. So before we enter the username in the form here, what we need to do is to come to our verification page widget, which is under onboarding view verification page. And you can see here that this page requires the email to be sent across. And we we'll also need the password and username details since those details will be required to enable us to resend the code to the user's email. We're gonna scroll up here and then we'll define a class. This class will have the following constructor, which requires the email, password and username fields. And then in our verification page, we're going to require this, whereby params is an instance of verification page params. And in order to work with this, we'll come to our routes, .dart file, which is under core, we need to refactor this logic. In here, we can retrieve the params object by creating a variable called params and then extracting our verification params object from state.extra. And then we'll have this logic to ensure that our verification page params object is defined. If so, then we can pass it here like that. And to make sure that we've passed the verification page params across, we'll return to our login page and over here, when we do context.push, we need to define the extra named argument, which will accept an instance of verification page params with our email, password, and username. Let's save this, and then let's restart the app. We'll come to login, we'll paste in the email, and then we'll create a password, and we'll set a username. Let's create an account. And there we go. And now that the verification code is sent, we can come to our email and then opening our email inbox, we're given this following message, follow this link to confirm your user with a hyperlink, which attempts to access locals 3000 with an access token. Given our use case, we expect a verification code instead of a URL. Fortunately, we're able to change that. So if we come to our dashboard, come to authentication, we see that our user we signed up with has been added, but then we want to come under email templates. And then over here in confirming our sign up, this is what is sent so far with the confirmation URL. We're using the confirmation URL token. However, what we want is the dot token placeholder, which will give us the six digit numeric email one time password. So I will select all of this and then replace it with this HTML containing the token and then let's save this once that is saved we will return to our authentication and also just to confirm that our trigger to populate our profiles table worked we can come to our table editor click on profiles and then we see our entry added here let's return to authentication and let's delete this user which should automatically delete the row from our profiles because we set it to cascade. And then we'll come back and let's create an account again. If we check our inbox, now we've got this verification code 
which is 280282. However, we've not implemented the verification yet. So let's look at that. We'll return to our verification page. And then over here, instead of the email placeholder, the email from our widget.params and get rid of this const. Okay, so now we see this email here. And then on submit, we want to invoke the verify method. Let's look at our verify method. We'll have our try catch block. Then we'll invoke the verify code method, passing across the email and then the verification code from our text editing controller, which is passed into our text form field over here. Upon successful verification, we'll display a successfully signed up message and then redirect to our home screen. And then if this fails, set a submitting to false and then we'll display this alert message and here we'll capture our error and then do to string. And let's move this const over here. So should we attempt to verify? Then we're redirected here to the home screen with the message that says successfully signed up. Let's look at the failure scenario. I'll return to the authentication section and then I'll remove this user. Then I'll stop this app and remove this app. Let's run this again. Let's go to login and then enter the temporary email address. Add a password, then create our account. So if we put in a wrong verification code and submit, yeah, then we get this message here. And then we've got the functionality to resend our verification code. So let's implement that. I'll have the same try catch block with our submit state. And then we want to invoke the sign up method again with the email password and username. And then if we're successful, we'll have a similar outcome over here without this context.go. And if there is a problem, and we need to be sure to reset is submitting to false at the very end. So let's try and resend the code. Okay, so we got this message called resend. And if we attempt to resend the code again, we get this auth message, which is because the code is resent every one minute. So let me go to my email and then I enter the code and then let's submit. Made a mistake. Let's try again. And there we go. We have successfully signed up. Before we move on, let's refactor how we're displaying the snack bar messages because at the moment it's a bit repetitive having to do all of that. And uh, the core directory, I'll create a utils.dart file and I'll make sure I export it over here. And then in our utils, what we're going to do is we'll create an extension on build context and be sure to import Flutter material. Our extension method will be called show alert, which will return a scaffold feature controller, which is what this method returns. We're going to copy all of this into here. We'll return it like so, and then context will be this, since it refers to the instance of our build context, and then takes this message, passes it in here. Okay, so now that we've got our extension method, we can simply do context.showAlert and then we'll show this message like so. And then we'll do the same over here. And then we'll do that here as well. And in here. And also in our login page right here. And then let's make sure to import the core.darts file, which exports our utils. Next, we need the UI on this home screen to reflect a user that is logged in, which involves hiding this login to the app button and displaying the floating action button at the bottom right, as well as the logout button at the top right. 
And before we do that, we need access to the authentication state, which Superbase gives us access to. We're going to implement our auth repository. So under auth, I'll create a new file. In here, we'll create our auth repository class. We'll also pull in the relevant imports. In our auth repository class, we'll retrieve a handle to Superbase client. And also we'll define a getter called auth state, which points to this on auth state change stream that we can listen to. And then lastly, we'll define our logout method where we invoke, where we invoke client auth sign out. And then to use this auth repository, we need to define our provider. And let's define our part file. And we'll run our code generation, which gives us this file here. I'll export this file. Since our auth state change is a stream, we can listen on this auth state using a stream provider. And we'll go ahead and do that by creating a new directory under auth. This will be our providers directory, and then we'll call it auth user. We'll have our relevant imports, and then we'll define our stream provider like so. Let's add our parts file and run our code generator. And then in here, we'll define our auth stream, read from our auth repository provider, and then we're listening on our auth state. And then we'll use our wait for to retrieve our auth state passed along our stream. And then we'll yield the auth state session user. So what that means is that when we log in, our auth state receives the logged in user that we can retrieve from the session object. And then to utilize the stream provider, we'll scroll to our memory directory under view, memory page. In here, we can retrieve the user doing a watch in our auth user provider. And then we need to be sure to export that from our auth dot dot file like so you can import that and then we want the stream as data and then we'll extract the value so this means that whenever our auth state changes riverpod will notify this widget and this widget will update accordingly so over here in our actions we want to check if the user is defined so it's not now and if that's the case, then we'll display this icon button. And let's remove this bit. This icon button will invoke the logout method on our auth repository provider when pressed. So let's save this, which gives us that. And for our positioned widget containing the login button, we want to have this in a conditional as well. So if the user isn't defined, then we want to display the button or else we don't show it. And also before the closing scaffold, we want to display the floating action button if our user is defined. So we'll have a ternary. If user is now, then we just have now or else we'll have our floating action button. And then the child will display the add icon. To confirm that our logic for the user works, click this button to log out, which brings us back to the default state. Let's implement our login functionality. So when we click on login to the app, we should be able to enter our email and password with the user that we just created and submit. We'll come to our auth repository and then we'll add a new method here called login, which takes in an email and password where we invoke client auth sign in with password. Let's save this, come to our login page and then over here in our login method. Similarly, we'll have a try catch and set our submit state and then invoke the login method in our auth repository provider with the email and password credentials and once we're logged in we will pop the current screen which should which will bring us back here or else we've got an error and we'll display that error message in our catch block in order to invoke this login method we will come over here to our submit widget in here We'll have this similar logic to our create account flow, and then we will invoke the login method. So should we try to submit? 
then we get this error. And then once we enter the correct credentials and submit, and now we're logged in and we can log out by clicking that. That's pretty much it as far as the login goes. And now we can move on to our memory items. Before we implement the UI for each of our memory items, it's worth having some data in our database. I'll come back to our dashboard and our, our authenticated users. I will copy this user ID. I'll come to our storage and our memories bucket. And then I'll create a new folder. The name of the folder will be the user ID. And then I'll select this folder and upload an image. Once our image is uploaded, I'll copy the name of this image. And then let's come to our table editor, our memories table, and let's insert our first row. We'll give it a title. Image ID will be the name of the image that we placed in the storage folder. And then the profile ID will select, we'll select this user and I'll save. So now that we've got our first entry, let's return to the code. To pull in the information we just added to our database, under the memory feature, I'll create a new file called memory repository. We'll create our memory repository and create our client variable pointing to superbase client. Let's import superbase. Then we'll create this method called get memories, which will pull the data from our database. In order to do that, we need to do client.from which allows us to perform a table operation on our memories table. And then we're going to do a dot select. And in here we set the columns we want, which is our ID, title, created our image ID. Since we have a foreign key constraint on the profile ID, we can reference the profiles table like so. And then we'll pull in the ID and then the username. And then we're gonna order the results based on the created at value. And then we need to cast this select operation to this type. So let's save that. And then over here, we'll define our provider. And then we'll import Riverport annotation, add our path file, and then run our code generator. Once code generation is completed, we'll go ahead and create our notifier, which will use this repository to load the information from our database. Under memory, I'll create a new file under providers and then we'll call this memory notifier we'll import our relevant dependencies and then we'll create our memory notifier which extends this identifier which will be code generated in here we'll up to override the build function and then we're going to read from our memory repository provider and invoke the get memories method so let's save this and before we run our code generator we need to export our repository over here and also export our notifier. And then we import the memory.darts file. We save this and then we run our code generator. Okay, that looks good. And now that we have our async notifier, we need to create a widget and we'll do that in our memory feature under widgets. We'll create a new file and we'll call this memory list view. We'll create a stateless consumer widget and then we'll sort out our imports. And then in the build method, we will read from our notifier provider. And then over here, we're gonna do memory notifier.when. When it's in the loading state, we want to display the circular progress indicator. When there's an error, we'll display the error text. And then once we're successful, we can render our masonry grid view. This is from the Flutter staggered grid view package. We can import it, there we go. We're going to set the following options for the cross axis count and the spacing. And the number of items is based on the length of items from our database. And then we'll define our item builder function. For now, we'll return a list tile widget. We will set the title, the title from our database. Let's save that. We will export the widget here. And then in our memory page, we will have a positioned.fail widget with our memory list view and be sure to import the relevant file. Let's save this. And then we see that our entry is here. To save us from working directly with map objects, let's create a data class that we can use to encapsulate the data coming from our database. 
If we come to our memory repository here, I add a then callback with our JSON information. Let's print out our JSON and then let's return it like so. I'll do a hot restart and then look in our debug console. So this is what we get. This means that we can create our model class, which will hold this value under memory. I'll create a new file under models and then call it memory. We'll define our memory class with our factory constructor, and then we'll have the following fields. And then for profile ID and username, since it's within the profiles map, we need to define these two functions to effectively detail how we retrieve these values. And then we'll define these functions up here like so. And then before we run code generation, we need to define our from JSON, which looks like that. And now we can run our code generation. There we go. We got these files over here. Let's refactor our repository to return that. So in here, we will return list of type memory. And then in here, we'll map over our data for each map item. We would produce a memory data object and let's export our memory data class in here. And then sort out our imports. Save that and then we'll come to our memory notifier and then let's run our code generator again. Let's come to our memory list view and then over here we can do the title. At this point I'll stop and let's start the app again. Okay, let's build out the look and feel of our memory items. I'll create a new widget called memory item view and let's create a stateless consumer widget. We will require the memory information and then we'll render a card with the following. For the child, we'll have a stack widget. Let's render out our image. We need the path to the storage URL, which Superbase exposes. We can come back to our memory repository and then over here, We'll add the following, which is a getter to storage URL provided by client. And then in here, we can retrieve the storage URL like so, and then have it here. And after our storage URL, we need to look in the object public directory. And then the name of our storage object is memories. And then we'll follow this by the top level folder name, which is the profile ID, followed by our image ID, which is the file name. So let's save this. And then we'll export this file. And then we'll return to our memory list view and this list tile widget will replace with our memory item view, which takes in data. And let's save that, which gives us our image here. We'll return to our item view. We can display the username at the bottom right with a positioned widget. We will have a styled container and the child will be a text widget. So let's save this and we can display the title at the top left, another positioned widget. This will take a container child with this text widget, which displays the title. Let's save this. Let's log into the app. Once we've logged in, let's implement the form for adding a new memory item. So this form will display when we click this float in action button. We'll create a new extension method under our core utils. This extension method will be responsible for displaying the modal bottom sheet from the material library. Let's save this. And then we'll create a new file under widgets. We'll call this memory item form. We'll define a consumer state for widget. We'll have the following state fields. In here, we'll have our form widget with our column and the title of our form. Let's save this and let's return to our memory page. And then down over here, we want to do context.show bottom sheet. And then for our child, we'll have a padding widget, which renders our memory item form. And let's export our memory item form. And once we click on that, we have our form. Let's continue to add 
the rest of our fields. We need our title field, which is a text form field, and it's got the following validation. At the moment, it's just required. Let's save. And next, we need to add some spacing, followed by our file upload field, which was in the starting files for this project. It takes the following options. Let's export our file uploader. Then import our library. We need to create this field in our state for the file. And then for file, we'll import .io. Let's save that. So now we should be able to select an image. Once I click on that and then pick an image, we see the file name for that image, which is retrieved from this file object. And then let's have our submit. And then we'll repeat this and have an outlined button that says delete. And we'll add a little bit of spacing. And when we hit submit, we want to ensure that the form is valid before submitting. So if we save this and we hit submit, we need to enter a title. And once we enter a title, then we should be able to freely submit it. We'll come to our memory repository and then we'll implement the relevant methods that will allow us to add, update and delete memory items. The first method takes the following information, the title and then the file object and we'll import that IO. The second method will be the update memory method, which will take in the memory ID and the updater title. And then lastly for this will be the delete memory method, which will take in the memory object and will perform our delete operation. When adding a memory, we'll be performing two operations. We'll be uploading the image to our storage bucket. And then secondly, we'll be inserting our record into the memories table. Let's retrieve the profile ID from our session by doing client auth, retrieving the current session, and then doing user.id. And then we'll extract the image ID, which is based on the file name. To ensure that we have the profile ID, we'll have a check. If it's null, we throw an exception, or else we'll add our entry to the database by doing client.from, and then our memories table, and then we'll invoke the insert method. We'll set our title, image ID, profile ID columns with their relevant values which ends our insert statement. Let's remove this question mark because it's required. Once our memory item is added, we can proceed to uploading the image by doing client storage.from and our storage bucket is called memories. And then we'll invoke the upload method. Our path is based on the top level folder, which is based on our profile ID, followed by the name of our file, which will be the image ID. And then here we'll provide the file object that we pass through. Let's save. Let's return to our memory item form. And then over here, we'll invoke the add memory method. Let's define it over here. We'll have a try catch block. And then let's ensure we have our file object or else we end over here. And then we'll trigger the add memory method, pass in the title and then our file. And then in our catch block, we can do context.showAlert and let's import the core library. However, before we display the alerts, we need to collapse this bottom sheet or else this alert message will not display. And also when we are successful in adding a memory, we also need to collapse the bottom sheet. So let's create this method over here called pop view. And then if it's mounted, we'll do a context.pop. And uh, let's import go router. We can use that method over here and over here. So that should we submit this form, I hit submit. It's collapsed and it should be added in our database. Let's check. And then I see that it's added over here. If we come to our table editor and look at our memories, we see our second entry over here. All right, so we've confirmed that our entry was added to the database. However, we cannot see that here unless we restart the app, at which point we now see that here. It will be useful to implement a subscription which will notify the UI of the new entry that we've added to our database so that the UI will update automatically without us having to restart the app. Fortunately, Superbase supports subscriptions to implement that, we'll do the following. We'll return to our memory repository and then we'll define a getter 
called memory channel will invoke the channel method on our Superbase client and then we'll give it a name, call it public memories after our table name. I'll save that and then we'll return to our memory notifier. And then in here we'll define a method which will initiate our memory channel. In this method, we will retrieve the reference to our memory channel and then we'll listen for changes to our Postgres database by invoking the on method. The type is an enum and we want real-time listen types dot Postgres changes. And then our filter accepts a channel filter. We specify the event and we'll use any event. The schema is public and the table is our memories. And then in here is a callback that will be invoked whenever events take place. For now, let's print out the payload that is returned containing the event information. And then let's not forget to invoke the subscribe method. And then lastly, we will invoke this method before we retrieve our memories. Save this and then do a hot restart. Let's add a new memory. When we look in our debug console, we see our event is emitted. This contains information about the schema and the table that we specified in our channel filter. All we care about is the event type over here. So this is an insert operation. And then new contains the information that was inserted. We can use this information. However, to simplify things, we can repeat this bit by doing the following since we are in an async notifier we can update our state by doing state equals and then we can do an async await here and we'll do async value dot guard and then we'll invoke our get memories method like so we need to change that to an underscore because ref is pointing to the wrong object let's save that and let's do a hot restart and then add a memory Okay, then let's look at the edit flow for our memory items. We'll return to our memory item view, and then we need to retrieve our logged in user by doing the following. And let's import the auth file. And then once we've got the details of our currently logged in user, let's have an if check if the user is not equal to null, and also if the currently logged in users ID matches profile ID of our currently logged in user, then we want to display the edit button. So this will be a centered field button. Looking like that. And then once we press this button, we want to do context.show bottom sheet. And then in here we'll render the form. However, since this is an edit flow, we'll modify this memory item form. This will take in details of a memory if it's defined, then we're in the edit flow or else we are creating a new memory. In our consumer state, we will override our init state function. And in here, we'll have to populate the title control with the value from our memory objects. So let's make this a late text editing controller. And then we'll cut this bit. And then in here, we will initialize our title control and pass in the value from our memory object. So now let's return to our memory item view. And then in here, let's pass in the memory object. Let's do a hot restart and let's see. And then for the image, we won't show the form. We'll show the image that was uploaded by returning to this form over here. We need to set the correct title here. So let's launch this. And then over here, we will do the following. If our memory object isn't defined, then we'll have new memory or else we'll display edit memory, which we see that here. Secondly, instead of displaying this file upload field, we'll have a condition. If our image ID is not equal to null, then we will render it out. And then the URL would be similar to our memory item view. So this one over here. In fact, what we can do is have this as a util function and use it as a provider. What I mean is we will return to our utils.dart. And what we do here is define a function. This function will take in the following named arguments. We'll retrieve the storage URL from our memory repository provider. And let's import. And then we'll do a return and build our URL. Save this and then let's run our 
code generation. Okay, once our code generation is completed, we will return to our memory item form. And then in here, we'll do a ref.read, import our image URL provider, which takes in our user ID, and then the file name will be that. And let's not miss the else block for this file upload field widget. So let's save this. And now we got that. So let's implement the submit behavior when editing our memories in our submit. We'll have an else if block. And in here, if our data is defined, then we are performing an update. So we'll invoke this update memory method, which we need to define. Over here, we'll define our method. We'll start by checking that our data memory object is defined. We'll have our try catch as usual. And then over here, we'll invoke the update memory method we defined earlier. This takes in our ID and then the updated title. Next, what we need to do is to complete the implementation of our update memory method. We will grab our current logged in profile. We'll invoke update and it's the title you want to update. And then we want to update where it matches our ID and also where the profile ID matches our currently logged in user ID. So should we edit this memory and then hit submit, then that should update our database. So we see the update here. However, we're not seeing that update here. I'll do a hot restart and let's update this again. Submit that. There we go. So it's actually working. We just needed to do a whole restart. Let's try that again. Okay, there we go. It works. So then let's implement the delete on our memory repository. We will retrieve the profile ID and then we'll retrieve a reference to our image ID. We need to do two things. To delete the image, we'll invoke the remove method, which takes a list. So we'll reference the folder, which is our profile ID, followed by our image ID. And then we will copy this and paste it here. The difference is update becomes delete and we'll get rid of that. And then ID will be the data ID. That's it for our delete behavior. We'll need to define this in our form and it looks pretty much the same to this one. So I'll copy this and then let's paste it here. And then we'll invoke delete memory while passing in widget.data. And then we'll invoke delete memory. Okay, let's test it. So I hit delete. And then there we go. Also, let's copy this bit for the submit button as well. And then let's look in our database to confirm that the memory entry is removed as well as our storage image has been deleted. Let's also refactor our memory item view to use our image URL provider that we defined. We can get rid of that, which means we can remove this line. Before we move on to the implementation of our likes counter, let's make a quick refactor in our memory notifier. Over here, we want to update the state based on our event type of our payload. Specifically, if the event type matches any of these values, then we want to run the operation to update our state. So I'll save that and do a hot restart. Now onto our likes counter implementation. What we'll do is we'll listen to our likes table for changes. And the way to do that is we'll come to our memory repository. We'll have a stream on our likes table. Since we don't need to worry about any foreign key constraints on the likes table, we can just use dot stream. We'll also implement two methods. First method will be add like, which will take in the ID of the memory that's been liked. And then in here, we will start by retrieving the current user profile. And then we'll do insert where we pass in the memory and profile ID. And then for the remove implementation, we'll duplicate this function, rename this. And then in here, we'll invoke the delete method. And we want to add a filter where the memory ID matches the memory ID we've passed in, and also where the profile ID matches the current user ID. So let's save that. From here, we need to implement a stream provider that'll listen on this stream, which we'll then use to update our UI. Let's create a new provider. We'll call it likes count. 
we will define our annotated stream provider function. Let's run our code generator. Okay. We'll retrieve a reference to our light stream and then we'll use an await for and we want to yield over likes where the memory ID matches our ID from the current memory item and then we'll return length. Let's save that. All right, to use the stream provider, we're going to create our widget for it. Under memory widgets, we'll create a new file, call it likes counter. We'll create a stateless consumer widget and let's update our exports. This likes counter will receive our memory object. And then over here, we'll retrieve our likes count from our stream. And then to retrieve the actual likes, we do likes count dot as data dot value. In here, we'll change this to a sized box with a field button and a style. And for our child, we'll have a row. This row will have our favorite icon followed by a flexible and then the text containing the number of likes. Then let's add a style to this. So to use this now, let's export it. And then in our memory item view, we'll have it positioned with our likes counter. Let's save that. We need to set width for this one. Let's center the items in our row which gives us that. And what we want to do is to retrieve our user and be sure to import auth.dart. And then over here on pressed, we want to check that our user is null or if our likes count is in loading state, then we want to set this as null or else. In here, we want to do ref.read and then add like. So then if we test this out by clicking one of these, our like has been added to the database and we've got this update here. Also, when we check our likes table, we see that our entry has been added. And then when we remove this, the UI should update to zero. In order to implement the remove operation, we need to know whether the user has liked this memory item already so that we do not invoke the add like method. Again, we invoke the remove like method where gonna have to modify our likes count stream instead of emitting integers let's create a new model and we'll call this likes info we'll annotate our likes info class and then we'll have a factory constructor with the following fields let's save this and run our code generation and let's export our model and then we'll return to our likes count and this will be now emitting a likes info object. And then for our yield, let's cut this and then we'll have likes info. And then for our count, we'll paste this. And then in order to define whether the user has liked this particular memory, let's port current user. And then over here, we'll do likes.any for each like. We want to check this condition. And also we want to check that the profile ID matches our current user ID. So now we're guessing the number of likes on this particular memory item, as well as a boolean indicating whether the currently logged in user has liked this memory item or not. Let's run the code generator. And let's come to our likes counter. We will change this to info. And then for our likes, we'll do info count or else we'll set zero as the default. Here we can do that. And then we can check if has liked equals true. That means they've liked this memory item already. Then we'll do remove like, passing in the data ID, or else we'll add our like. And let's restart. Okay, so when we click on that, we like it. And then when we click on it again, it's removed. Let's modify the look and feel of this counter. Once we like, the memory item, we want to change the color to red to indicate to the currently logged in user that they've liked this memory item. We'll come to our icon widget for the color. We want to check if info has liked equals true. Then we want the red accent or else we'll have white, which therefore looks like that. And when we click that again, it's back to white and should work. 
with all of these like so if we like this again and we log out we see that it's back to white again because the user is not logged in i have another condition here like so if it's more than zero we'll show white or else we'll have a slightly transparent white so let's save that which looks like that and should we log in then it's red let's like a couple more items and then let's log in with the other account And then we can also add a like to these two. And when we log out, we get that. Our implementation is now complete. Here's what the full flow looks like. When we go to login. I'll create a new account. Like so. We'll enter an incorrect verification code. And we get that message. And when we hit resend code, we need to wait for 45 more seconds because Superbase enables the resend behavior after every minute. And then after a minute, let's resend. Okay, and then we got code resend. Then I'll paste the recent verification code and then we hit submit and there we go we're logged in let's add an image and let's add our new memory let's add some likes let's edit our memory and then let's delete Okay, that is good. And then we can log out. All right. And this brings us to the end of the mini course. Be sure to like this video and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I make tutorials teaching developers to build full stack applications with Dart and Flutter. If you've got any feedback, any comments below, do let me know. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.